And uh, welcome to the Cape Town Press Club at Home, uh, another one of our virtual events. Um, we were able to do this thanks to the generous support of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation and also thanks to our technical producer, Mahrit Krunewald. We're coming to you today from three different cities, so coordinated around load shedding timetables and the internet allowing. Um, we will proceed, and I will also next week uh, be speaking to former Johannesburg Mayor Herman Mashaba and the week thereafter to Agba's chief economist, Wandili Sikhrobo, about the impact the COVID-19 pandemic is having on food security uh, in South Africa. We bring you these events free, but that doesn't mean they don't cost anything. And I'd like to thank all the club members who've already made financial contributions so that we can continue doing this. Today's a special day for us. It's the annual Barry Streak Memorial Lecture. Barry Streak was a parliamentary journalist for over 25 years uh, author of several books, and he was deputy chair of the Cape Town Press Club in 2006 when he passed away. Um, we're very pleased uh, to also administer a bursary in his name uh, for journalism students. And this year, the 2020 Barry Street Memorial Lecture, which we've done every year since, um, will be presented by Professor Anton Harbour, Journalism in the Time of Multiple Crises. Professor Harbour was the founding editor of the Weekly Mail, later known as the Mail and Guardian. He's been the chair of several major bodies uh, to do with journalism and the freedom of expression, and he serves on the board of directors of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Just a reminder that you can post a question at any time uh, while he's speaking, but I'll try and fit in as many as I can, but we'll get to those after the address. So for now, I'm handing you over to Professor Anton Harbour. Thank you very, very much, Brent. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to uh, speak at the Cape Town Press Club, to connect uh, even virtually with many uh, <laughs> colleagues of long standing. And it's a particular honor um, to be doing it uh, in the memory of Barry Streak, somebody many of us knew well, respected, and uh, and greatly admired and uh, and loved. Um, so thank you very kindly for the opportunity. As you can tell by the title of my talk today, I think we live in a time when crisis seems to be piling on top of crisis. Who would have thought that the existential threat, the enormous threat of climate change, could be pushed down the agenda by a more immediate threat? As the COVID, as the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic has done. And on top of this, we layer a second pandemic, that of mis and dis and malinformation. In the midst of these great challenges swirling around us, we're experiencing the rapid shrinking of our journalistic world. Advertising disappears, print titles close or are threatened with closure, Hundreds of our fellow journalists face the threat of losing their jobs. A number have had their pay slashed. And worse, I'm sorry to say, seems likely to come. According to Sarnef, during the pandemic, at least 80 small, mostly local publishing houses have closed their doors. So far, around 700 journalists have lost their jobs. The Freelancers Association report that 60% of their membership has lost around 70% of their income and some more. And now we hear this week of possible further retrenchments at Media24, SABC and Prime Media. This is a picture of devastation in our news media industry. We know that this isn't purely local. In the US, as many as 40% of newspapers have closed in the last decade. And we know it's not caused by the COVID pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated what was happening already. It has cut short our time to adapt, to move to online digital media, and to find a way to sustain journalism when the traditional business model of news media has collapsed. But the result is that at a time when the flow of reliable news and information, debate, discussion is more important than ever to deal 
with these multi-layered crises. We in the news media find ourselves with fewer resources to deal with these issues, which means we leave the space open to the many who seem to peddle disinformation, to disrupt democracy, to sow discord, to mislead, to cause harm. It's a timely moment to evoke the memory of Barry Streak. Different people will have different memories of a multifaceted person like Barry Streak. But what I recall and want to emphasize today are two elements of this legacy. The first is that Barry was nothing more and nothing less in my view than a dedicated professional reporter, committed to the task, finding the news, getting it out there and explaining it as best he could. It's the hard slog of everyday reporting and the scrutiny of public life that is the basic public service of journalism. It was his lifelong calling and one he answered with a rare consistency and reliability. I recall Barry plowing through the tomes of parliamentary reports to find the tidbits that made news, those elements that bureaucrats try to hide amidst the volumes of paper, but which we needed to know. He wasn't motivated by money or fame, but by the public service of good, solid accountability reporting. I know that well because apart from the work he did from his employer, he did work for us at the Weekly Mail as well on the side. We could barely pay him, but he wanted the news out. He wasn't concerned that he couldn't put his name on it. Because public service, that is what defines journalism at its finest. I evoke this because we are seeing now as a result of the shrinking of newsrooms and the loss of titles, less and less of this regular daily reporting of the critical elements of our society. The information we need to nourish our democracy and repair our economy. What happens in Parliament, the courts, the factories, the streets, local government, the schools, the hospitals, these critical minutiae that breathe life into citizenship and empower us to be active, involved citizens and not just live as subjects. This reporting, this work by people like Barry, is, I am very saddened to say, diminishing. Smaller newsrooms mean less reporting and less good reporting. And it means that citizens may not have the reliable information they need to be active citizens. Social media often alerts us to events that happen in public. But what we have less and less of is the reporter who scrutinize, scrutinizes the minutes the financials of their local town council, warns us that the numbers don't add up or the water system is being neglected. Those who check those alerts that we get on social media and separate the fact from the fiction and tell us what is real and put it in context and tell us of its significance. Now we learn of the collapse of effective local government after the fact when the Auditor General reports it, or the water stops running. Journalists should be playing the absolutely critical role of society's early alert system. And we struggle to do that. We also know that disinformation is not new. The attempts by many for alternative purposes, for malign reasons, to spread false information for personal gain or to cause political discontent is not new, existed always in fact, but it has become much more rampant and destructive through social media. By disinformation, I'm not talking about errors of fact or gossip, but the deliberate and malign manipulation of news with the intention of sowing division and conflict in our society and undermining our democracy. It is rife. We know that it was a significant factor in the election of Donald Trump and the Brexit vote. We also see now 
that untruths about COVID, disinformation and malinformation about COVID has helped the pandemic spread and has cost lives. Never has the work of journalists, the researching, the verification, the editing, the selection, the separation of fact from fiction, the contextualization been more important. And seldom have we been in as weak a position as we are in to deal with it. The second aspect of Barry's legacy that I think it's important to remember at this time is that Barry was a political reporter at a time of heightened conflict during the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s. I can't remember Barry writing a report that wasn't balanced, fair, fact-based, and as complete as possible under the circumstances. Yet, one had no doubt where his sympathies lay, where he stood on the big moral issues, what his values were. We saw then, and we are seeing now, in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and worldwide, that journalists are forced to confront their own positions, views, and biases. It's a good thing. You can't claim to be magically and uniquely free of bias or racism or prejudice. And hopefully being made to be more self-aware will us help us cut through prejudice and bias. But at the same time, we can't be neutral on matters of principle. We are not and shouldn't be neutral on issues like racism or inequality. We have values, we hold values, and we allow them to inform our journalism proudly. I think this is important to remember when we see many of our political reporters playing not just a party political role, but a role in intra-party factionalism. It seems to me the successful skill of a good political reporter is to be fair and balanced and dedicated to truth-telling, but also to imbue one's work with a sense of fundamental democratic and social values. Not to pretend to be objective or value-free, but also not to play party and intra-party politics. We don't see enough today of the political reporter whose first obligation is to truth-telling and public service, who are there to serve fundamental values rather than partisanship. It's a difficult path to tread, and it's tempting to veer off that path always, and there's often pressure to veer off that path. But it is the root of good, solid, fact-based reporting and that's what we remember Barry for. Recently, my colleague, Max Dupria, delivered the keynote address at uh, our Taco Caper Awards Ceremony for investigative reporting. And he said that in the face of these challenges, the best thing we could do was to produce great, high-quality journalism, to demonstrate its value. To sh and, 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 and that will encourage public support for what we do. He was right, of course. And it is what Barry would have done. Find the story, verify it, complete it, get it out there, move to the next important story. So at this difficult time, when I've painted a picture that can look quite bleak, we need to ask ourselves, where does hope lie? for our troubled industry and profession. Well, we are seeing some of the gaps in our traditional media coverage being filled by small, specialist, non-profit outfits, backed usually by philanthropists. I think it is to the great credit of some of our business and foundation community that they've recognized the importance of stepping in to fill a gap that the market has been unable to fill on its own. I love the irony when people say that philanthropy is not a sustainable way of backing journalism. When at the moment it looks like normal market forces, the standard commercial system, that is proving unsustainable. 
this time and place, philanthropy sometimes seems like the only sustainable solution. And these journalistic outfits, small, specialist as they are, are doing, I think, some of the most important and valuable reporting in our society and feeding it in to bigger, more traditional outlets. I think of Ground Up, of Amabungani, of Becca Caesar, of Scorpio at Daily Maverick, of Oxpeckers, of New Frame, for example, and there are others. And it reminds me of the 1980s when there were individuals and groups of journalists who, both in mainstream newsrooms and in the alternative media, continued to find ways to do the journalism that needed to be done under very difficult circumstances. Diff different circumstances, different challenges to what we face now, um, but equally serious. Of course, when we look globally, we see hope in those news publications that have continued to invest in good, trustworthy, unique journalism, and therefore have been able to attract online subscribers or members. The frustration for us in South Africa is that this seems to work best in global high-end publications, like the New York Times, the, the FT, The Guardian, The Economist. But the fundamental lesson is there. If you produce great content, people will want it, be prepared to pay for it in one form or another. There's a greater hunger than ever for credible, verified, trustworthy, quality information. We have no shortage of information. We have shortage of credible, trustworthy information. Good example of one of the success stories is, of course, the Washington Post. That great paper had been reduced to a money-losing, second-rate rag, I'm afraid, producing very little interesting journalism. When Amazon's uh, Jeff Bezos bought in, many people were nervous. He doesn't have the best reputation. But he had the wisdom to be hands off on the editorial and invest in both journalists and technology. And it's fascinating to see that he's turned it back into not just a profitable, but a respected and important and powerful voice in American politics and in global politics. I am sorry to say that I have largely lost faith in the capacity of our South African media owners to show the kinds of wisdom, flexibility, innovation, courage, commitment to do what has to be done to turn our industry around. Sadly, our ownership is dominated by short-term cost cutters who seem to serve themselves rather than the public. Where we need vision, we have myopia. One heartening fact, I must say, is the rise of the fact-checking industry, whether it is within newsrooms or in independent organizations like Africa Check, which I'm associated with. We have to work hard, determinedly, to reestablish the primacy of facts and truth in the fake of an onslaught from social media, from dangerous political leaders who have no respect for fact and truth. And we must also say, second-rate journalists who have sacrificed the profession for the quick, nasty story. I'm just finishing and sending to press a book due out in October, that deals with the role the media played in state capture in this country. And I can tell you that parts of the picture of the role some journalists, some media institution played are pretty dark. But I also take hope from the rising tide of pressure for the social media giants, the big five, like Facebook and Twitter, to reform themselves and to start acting 
against disinformation, hate speech, and the capacity of malign autocrats to undermine democracies. I think we have often underestimated the danger of a platform like Facebook in the hands of a chief executive who resists taking responsibility for what happens on his platform and for when it is abused. Hopefully, the defeat of an enemy of media freedom and good journalism in the US presidency will lead to greater scrutiny of these platforms, subject them to some socially responsible norms and regulations. I think one must note that media freedom observers have cautioned about the evidence of populist leaders using the COVID pandemic as a cover for action against our media and against journalists they do not like. In our own country, we have accepted emergency media restrictions. Very different to those we had in the 80s, one must say. Not that kind of wide ranging, all encompassing gray regulation that made working so difficult. But we will have to be vigilant to ensure there isn't a temptation to carry these beyond the emergency. I've emphasized the role of our media in day to day coverage, in providing the information we need to operate as active citizens. But of course, we know there are other roles that are equally important, such as representing all elements of our society and all views in our national debate, bringing people together to exchange and share those views, to create a marketplace of the best ideas and the best information that we need to shape our economy and our democracy. But in all of these aspects, under current pressures, I'm afraid our be I believe our media is falling short. Reflecting and failing to rise above the racial and economic divisions in our society. I'm talking widely, I'm talking generally, but of course there are exceptions. And that's what gives us hope. The pockets of excellent coverage, whether it's in coverage of the pandemic or investigative reporting. Our faith is maintained, our faith in our profession is maintained from those few individuals who remain dedicated to journalism as the fourth estate, holding the other three up for scrutiny, and who see it above all as a public service. When we judged this year's Taco Cape Awards, for example, we saw in the top shortlist of 11 entries extraordinary work that showed that there were real pockets of powerful, valuable, world-class work. And it's that uh, that maintains our faith and our hope in the work we do. I am concerned that the deterioration, deteriorating condition of, of our media is often viewed as a sectoral media industry concern, a market problem. We need to find a new digital business model and things will come right, we are told. But I want to emphasize that the flow of information is too important to our economy and our democracy to leave to the vagaries of the market and to the existing industry to sort out. Let's be clear, they are failing. We need to recognize, we need to get our country to recognize that the state of our media is not just a sectoral problem, but a social problem, a national problem, and one that we need to address on a much larger scale. We need to pull together the best minds of the country to find the way to enable journalists to continue their important work. In these difficult times, 
I believe we must reassert the fundamentals of our calling as journalists. We seek truth, we aspire to balance and fairness. We hold all those who wield power up for scrutiny. And we try to speak and bring into the conversation and to engage with all of our fellow country people. But most of all, we need to reassert journalism as a public service. For it is in that role that we bring real value and can hope for that value to find its proper place and recognition in our society. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, that was thought provoking and sobering, uh, but also encouraging. Um, we now can go to our questions, and we have a question. We only have one at the moment. We've got a couple of hundred people on, so I don't know what they're waiting for. Uh, Marilyn Keegan is asking, to what extent do you think social media can be regulated uh, to moderate disinformation? Certainly. Um, look, we, we, we always prefer self-regulation, so we would be much happier um, if we saw the uh, social media major platforms being prepared to take the responsibility on for themselves. And they started to do so, but only um, under pressure and only what they're forced to do. And we see some, like Facebook, that are constantly reluctant and constantly unwilling to do so. I, I don't want to suggest that it's a simple or easy problem or uh, to deal with because it can threaten media freedom. Um, important and valuable conversation takes place in social media, and we want to encourage that uh, and make sure that we're targeting malinformation, the deliberate attempt to use um, disinformation to cause harm and damage. But let me emphasize there's two aspects that we need to think about and confront. The first, as I've said, is um, malinformation and disinformation. The second is the reality that the social media and search platforms are gobbling up all the revenue, all the advertising. Um, and in countries like South Africa, paying very little or no tax. So mm. these are global problems that we need to confront. And, and as I say, we, would pref we always prefer self-regulation. Um, um, but so far, uh, we've seen too much reluctance in those in those media platforms to take responsibility. Mm. Yes, I have to say that I've had some of my own, I've always been quite radical on, on press freedom um, and freedom of expression, but I have to say it has been quite a challenging time, I think, for many journalists um, when we're facing the kind of malicious disinformation that goes around and the effects of that, um, I think, really uh, is something which we have to deal with. Um, I was um, wanted to also ask you a little bit more about the state capture issue, and uh, perhaps, and we look forward to the book coming out. And perhaps you can just tell us uh, what's the title for a start, and what you're going to address in that, which is relevant to us right now. So the book is called "So for the Record." Jonathan Ball is publishing it around October. Um, it takes a close look at. Um, those who exposed and helped stop state capture through the Gupta leaks expose and through other work they led up to that. So it takes a close look at the role they played, but it also takes a part uh, in particular um, those journalists and institutions, notably uh, in this case, the Sunday Times, who carried coverage and reportage that assisted state capture, that assisted those who were trying to capture institutions like SARS or the Hawks. And so I take a close look at, why, at how that happened, why it happened in those institutions, because there are clearly lessons we have to learn to prevent that happening again. Hmm. I mean, do you think that, uh, are you saying, do you think media freedom is, um, under siege in South Africa in some ways? And what are the forces behind that? Or do you think it's mostly a market problem? That's I think it's overwhelmingly a market problem. 
Mm -hmm. uh, our threat is what's happening in the market. Um, um, there are threats to our media freedom, and we have to remain vigilant. Um, social media harassment of journalists, and, and in particular um, women journalists, um, has been a major problem, as an example. I've cited the emergency regulations, which I think are by and large accepted as necessary in a difficult time, but which we have to watch carefully and not allow them to encroach uh, into uh, beyond the emergency. Um, but the real threat we're facing is our capacity to do what we need to do as journalists because um, the market is unable to sustain or enable the work we do. Right. Um, and uh, ally today, we've just got a question from Donald Presley um, asking whether the mainline newsprint newspapers are going to survive in South Africa at all. Um, and perhaps I can just add to that. Um, I'd be interested to know if you've given any thought to what kind of uh, business model for a newspaper or broadsheet would work for our purposes as journalists. You mentioned Look. philanthropy. No, well, philanthropy fills certain gaps, as I've said, and plays a very important role. Um, um, but, but mostly that's in smaller operations, as I've said. And when you look at the major media um, houses, um, particularly, the, particularly newspapers, which Donald asked about, um, it seems clear to me that the model that's working around the world is uh, where you successfully convert your readership or grow your readership as online subscribers or members or some form of payment for news. So what I don't think we can avoid is the reality that our consumers will need to pay um, um, for the news we give them and they, they will, they will, there will be some advertising, but it doesn't seem the model works without uh, payment subscription or membership payment in some form. And um, those who are succeeding at doing that are showing that they can get significant income from that and people are prepared to pay if your content is good and unique enough. You can't offer what everyone else offers. Um, um, and, so, and so we haven't had great success in this country with paywalls and a subscription. Um, but it seems to me it's the way to go. But you do have to invest, otherwise you're in a downward spiral of, uh, of uh, cutbacks, less unique information, and then people saying, why must I pay for this when I can get, it's not unique, I can get it for free. But if you look at the, those who, who've done it, the New York Times, the Guardian being uh, uh, some of the best examples, um, it's, been, it's, it's been successful and they've grown their readership substantially. Right. Yeah, th there is the, the saying that all news is local and one does worry that, you know, one's not getting enough local news and those smaller newspapers and things, you know, maybe following what's happening at the local school board, um, you know, what is there any corruption taking place where a lot of corruption does happen on a, on a very local scale is not necessarily being covered. There's nobody doing those beats anymore. We've got a question from Marion Edmonds that I think speaks to that. Um, saying, what are your daily and weekly reads? What South African media do you consume on a regular basis? Because you feel it's essential for understanding the country around you. Um, look, um, it's part of my job, I suppose, as a media watcher to consume always as much as possible. Um, I will say that my, my first basic daily read is Business Day. Um, um, but every day I, I sample and move around. Um, I, will be, I will be frank and say I must admit I'm reading less and less of our, our friends at uh, Second Jalo Independent because we've seen a very sad deterioration there. Uh, but I do every now and then dip in to follow what they're doing. Uh, but I try and vary my reading enormously. And uh, I find myself, I must say, doing more global reading, more international reading. The New York Times, The Guardian, being two that I read on a regular basis. Hmm. And, but should you... I, and sorry, let me, let me, let me say, um, I do, the, 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 the sites I talked about, 
the smaller South African nonprofit sites are an essential part of one's daily diet at this at this stage, I think. Which are largely su supported by donor foundations and subscribers, right? C correct. I mean, maybe Daily Maverick is the one that tries to be most commercial. Um, and that's going to be an important one to to watch for the th things I'm saying about viability. Um, but yes, uh, every day I see I see what the philanthropists have paid for, and I say thanks to them. Hmm. I'm also curious to know that you know, relating to these issues we've talked about. Um, so, with other words, the influence of social media. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, and that. What do you see in the universities coming out of the journalism schools and the students? How have they been affected? And, and is there a shift in the way that people t talk about media freedom and talk about what their careers are and how, how they want to proceed and become journalists? Has there been a shift there? I know it's a big question. It, it is a big question. And let me give you a few observations that we see at Wits and elsewhere. The first is that... We, we do continue to get a very good quality of journalism student I, uh, at WITS. Um, our numbers aren't large, and we purposely keep the numbers low because um, it would be foolish to produce more people than the market can absorb. Um, but there's no question, and we've just looked at our first semester marks for this year, that we're getting a good quality of student, and I think that's interesting and important. But there's also no question that we're constantly having to ask ourselves and engage in discussion with our students about what we mean by journalism, uh, what training is required, uh, because that's changing all the time and growing, expanding. So it's a huge challenge to know what to prioritize, what to teach, what to leave out um, uh, from our curriculum, and to revise it all the time. It, ca it can be less and less platform-based, um, because um, you because the platforms change all the time, so you'd be teaching people technologies that are going to be redundant by the time they 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 graduate. So so it's my belief that you want to values and skills of journalism um, that are technology and platform neutral, uh, but it's a constant and ongoing debate to work out what those are. And is the idealism still there, or is there more idealism than ever? Um, it's a mix. It's a mix. Um, um, students of today are very career-oriented, of, of necessity, um, because, you know, we, we, we do draw students from a more diverse class background than, than we did in the past. So mm -hmm. issues of getting jobs finding work um, uh, remain uh, very, may remain foremost in their minds, but they are not without idealism and enthusiasm. Um, uh, although I always need to be careful not to generalize. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is, is a lot of litigation um, these days. I mean, I know, you know, a number of organizations, um, ground up included, you know, we've sort of, you know, we've been taken for, we've been sued for, for writing and for exposing things. And the costs are, even if you are winning the cases and even if there's no basis to the case brought against you, um, th there are significant costs uh, for uh, for media houses. Um, do you think that there is more of this kind of lawfare going on um, to attack media? Um, how do you feel about it? Look, that kind of lawfare comes in waves. Um, in a sense, it's, uh, it speaks well of the media that it's challenging um, power and uh, and forcing them to 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 resort to those kinds of measures, but of course it is terribly difficult to can threaten publications if abused. I mean, people naturally have a right to defend themselves and take legal action, but when it's abused, as it often is, and one sees a rise in the abuse of the legal process to attack journalists, 
Um, then it, it is a threat to our media freedom, and we have been seeing a new wave of it, I think, coming forward. We rely enormously on our courts to help us get rid of frivolous, malicious legal action. And so far, I would say our courts have been pretty good on that. I wonder if you could just, in closing then, um, maybe just sketch for us um, some idea of how you see, um, looking to a crystal ball, um, how do you see the media landscape unfolding in, in, in South Africa, say, of, of the next few years? <laughs> Listen, if we've learned anything in the last 20 years, it's don't predict what will happen in the media. There we were predicting, uh, we had a few years to deal with the transition to online digital media, and it disappeared um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because of a threat that, uh, that, that shocked us all, the, the pandemic. Um, I do think that, as I've said, I think the model that will prevail is consumers paying more um, to get valuable information. I think there'll be a resurgence of the value of journalism um, because people find it harder and harder to deal with the amount of disinformation that's out there. And therefore, the, the work that journalists do, of verification and editing and selecting, becomes more and more valuable. And, uh, and, then, and then if we do that job well, people will pay for it. Um, I mean, I see radical changes in the structure and form of our media industry, but I've learned to be very careful about predicting that. There's new technology all the time, and our predictions about how the public uses that technology is almost always wrong. Um, uh, we, almost, we always learn differently how people tend to use the technology um, and, and consume media. Um, so I, I, it's, it's a fool who predicts how media is going to look like even in two years time. Thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you for giving us the lecture and uh, for the talk and, and taking a whole lot of questions, which I'm sure you were not expecting. And uh, we look forward to catching up and we look forward to seeing your book uh, when it comes out. Um, thank you, everybody who watched us on YouTube and on Facebook. So all the things we said about Facebook today, um, but we were broadcast there. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.